sensitive surface called the retina. This retina passes the impression onto the optic nerve, which sends it to the brain. The reflection will stay on the retina as long as the object is in view. When we look away, the images disappear. But notice that the image in the brain does not disappear immediately. It fades a fraction of a second after the object is removed. This slow fading is called persistence of vision. The persistence of vision has become a commonplace explanation for the way moving images work. The concept is often explained all too briefly with the expectation that it renders the illusion of the moving image comprehensible, but it does not. Persistence of vision is simply one aspect of our perception of motion. This video will explore this mythic concept as well as some lesser known aspects of perception, such as the stroboscopic effect, phi phenomenon, and beta movement. So, how do moving images actually work? Well, you're presented a series of still images in rapid succession, and even though no real movement happens, the still images are played in a sequence at the right speed, creating the appearance of movement. This is what we call a motion picture. This display of successive frames takes advantage of something called persistence of vision. Because images stay in your mind after you see them, leaving an impression, the film frame two leaves an impression. And so each frame after the next stays in our mind, and we're able to comprehend it as one constant stream, right? Well, not exactly. Take a basketball game, for instance. It's the end of the game, the teams are tied, and a player goes for the desperate three-pointer, and it miraculously makes it. When he puts the basketball through the hoop, you see the ball go through the hoop. You really do. But there's not a single frame that captures it. The ball never goes through the hoop, so your mind fills it in. It filled in the movement between the frames, Except, persistence of vision doesn't explain this. The fact that we retain images doesn't change the fact that we never see the ball go through the hoop. This is exactly where the persistence of vision fails to explain the illusion of movement. In this day and age, visual media surrounds us and is essentially part of all of our everyday lives. Yet despite the proliferation and near omnipresence, very little knowledge is widespread about how it works. When it comes to explaining how the illusion of film and video operates, there's only that one widespread explanation, the persistence of vision. This term floats around in the popular consciousness as an acceptable and comprehensible explanation for visual media. If you need an example, look no further than this General Motors ad. To throw the picture on the screen, there is a bright light with a reflector behind it to send the light rays in the right direction and a lens to concentrate the light. The film passes a hole or aperture which lets the light go through only one picture at a time. There is another lens to focus the pictures on the screen. Let's start the machine moving. The still pictures blur because they're moving all the time. And this won't do at all. We need something to hold each picture still long enough for us to look at it in between the changes. When the film is started and stopped in rapid succession, the eye sees the changes being made and the result is streaks instead of movies. So we need a shutter to cut off the light while every change of picture is being made and let light through only while the film is standing still. Surprising as it seems, you never see a motion picture while it is actually moving. The only time a movie moves is when the shutter keeps you from seeing the change of picture. And now, when you see motion pictures, you get a true picture of what really happened. A picture that you could never see in any other way. Although most people associate the term with a type of illusion, which seems almost miraculous, it nonetheless underplays how complex the illusion is and oversimplifies our current understanding of human psychology and the nature of perception itself. When people talk about persistence of vision, 
It's really a type of shorthand for a whole world of strange and mysterious interactions between our minds and optical illusions. Persistence of vision, as it is understood today, is really only a facet of what this phenomenon really is. Although persistence of vision may seem like a satisfactory explanation to many, once you start looking at the history of visual illusions and our understanding of them, things start to become much more complicated. When you appreciate how complicated these illusions really are, you can gain a greater understanding of how different forms of technology exploit different vulnerabilities of our perceptual systems. Film, video, and television are not just different types of displays, they are completely different ways of seeing. Everyone, it would seem, knows that moving pictures are made by projecting a series of stationary frames on a screen in rapid succession. Yet few people seem to be curious about the basis of this effect, and those who are seem to be satisfied with an incorrect explanation. The fact of the matter is that we do not know why movement is perceived. Irvin Rock, An Introduction to Perception The story of the theory of persistence of vision largely begins with a series of explanations in response for this strange effect by Peter Marc Roger. In 1821, a letter called Account of an Optical Deception was published in the Quarterly Journal of Science, Literature, and the Arts. The author observed that sometimes when a wheel rotates, the straight fence slats appear to be curved. The illusion, he says, is best observed when the spokes are in dark color and a bright light shines on the wheel. He equates the effect with that of a closed circle of light caused by a luminous object being rotated quickly. If you don't know what he means by this, think of the way that sparklers and fireworks are able to achieve the appearance of a continuous stream of light rather than looking like random particles of light. He claims that both of these optical effects are caused by the way images linger in the retina from an account of an optical deception, John Murray. Quote, the peculiarity of this optical illusion is that the bend of the spokes are consistently convexed downward. The curvature remains the same regardless of whether the wheel is turned towards the right or towards the left of the observer. A specific speed of the wheel is required. The curvature can be seen more completely when the spaces between the spokes through which one looks at the wheel are narrow. For the same reason, this illusion is perceived best when the spokes are darker in color or shaded, and when bright light is projected on the wheel. In order to create these appearances, it is crucial that a progressive movement occur simultaneously as a revolving movement. The true reason for this illusion is therefore also the same as the delusion that takes place when one sees a closed circle of light caused by a luminous object being rotated quickly. The impression is that a sufficiently strong beam of light has ascertained enduring effects on the retina. He continues, an impression made by a pencil of rays on the retina, if sufficiently vivid, will remain for a certain time after the cause has ceased." Unquote. This is considered one of the first accounts of persistence of vision, and for our purposes, the beginning of how this concept intertwines with how we think about cinema. start understanding the persistence of vision and related concepts is the pre-cinema invention known as the Fena Kistoscope, or the stroboscopic disc. This mesmerizing device was one of the earliest examples of moving image illusionism. It was invented by a Belgian physicist named Joseph Plateau, who wanted to demonstrate the ways in which our perception of objects can be manipulated into creating illusions of motion. Although Plateau is not as nearly well-remembered as the other pioneers of the moving image, such as Edward Muybridge, the Lumiere brothers, or Thomas Edison, his contributions to how we understand visual media are indispensable, and much of our modern theories rely largely on his work. 
The more we understand the figure of Joseph Plateau, the more we'll be able to understand how the theory or myth of persistence of vision came to be. Joseph Antoine Ferdinand Plateau was born in 1801 in Brussels to a well-respected painter, Antoine Plateau. His father encouraged an interest in art, which likely had an influence on Plateau's academic work, which addressed intersections between the artistic and technical. His parents both tragically died when he was young, only 14 years old, and he was sent to live in the countryside to recoup from the loss. At this time, he grew interested in the sciences and he began a butterfly collection and grew interested in mechanical devices through interactions with his great uncle, who was a master blacksmith. In this time in the country, he also happened to bear witness to the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. He soon returned to Brussels and returned to school, and at the age of 16 began a lifelong friendship with his math teacher, Adolphe Quetzalet. He began attending university in 1822, where he began by studying art but soon focused on physics and mathematics. He continued his studies while working as a math teacher. At the time, he wasn't associated with any particular university as a student, but began working on a dissertation by working on his creative and unique experiments. Plateau soon set his dissertation to his close friend and former teacher, Quetelet, whose reaction was full of excitement and approval. He then submitted his dissertation to the University of Liege. It was called dissertation on some properties for the impression produced by light on the organ of sight. And this paper laid the groundwork for much of his life's work. It contained research he had done on the effects of color on the retina and perceived distortions caused by movement. In it, he described an experiment where he stared into the sun for 25 seconds. When, later in his life, he lost his eyesight, he blamed this experiment. He described for the first time the effect of colors on the human retina their distortion, intensity, and observed colors. He was the first scientist to determine that the duration of an impression on the human retina from the time it appears until it's barely sensible lasted up to 0.34 seconds. He also described his research on the geometric superposition of moving curves, the perception and deformation of moving images, and the reconstruction of deformed images, thus laying the foundation for his later development of his phonetoketoscope. Plateau earned his PhD in 1829, and soon after, Quetelet published parts of it in his academic journal, Correspondence Mathematique et Physique. At this time, he invented a device he called the anarthoscope, or anoscopic disc. This device utilized anamorphosis, a form of media in which an image is only recognized from a specific vantage point. The device contained an anamorphic picture which appeared distorted when still, but undistorted when in continuous rotational motion. The project was born out of the mysterious wheel effect observed by Roger. Plateau independently noticed the optical illusion of the motion wheel during his own experiments, and then later read Roger's article. He soon developed his unique anorthoscope, and when showing it to others, he described it as a totally new sort of anamorphosis. He first called it the anorthoscope in a letter to Quetelet, After sending one of the discs to Michael Faraday, a prominent scientist at the time, he said, It has wonderfully surprised many to whom I have shown it, and they all refuse to believe their own eyes, and cannot admit that the forms seen are the things looked at. Plateau's invention, which would soon follow, was inspired by an exchange with Faraday. Inspired by Plateau's experimentation with spinning discs, Faraday began building off of his experiments eventually suggesting a unique viewing method which would prove revolutionary. To view a spinning disc through slits with regularly spaced intervals while gazing at the disc's illustration in a mirror. This method led to Plateau's most important invention, what many consider to be the first real step towards cinema. While Faraday's experiments involved discs with small cutouts which looked like wheels, Plateau took it one step further and attempted the mirror experiment with a repeated image. He soon began creating short animations, which featured simple looping motions. 
After publishing the results of his experimentations, Plateau soon dubbed his invention Finicistoscope, which was inspired by the Greek root words for deceiving and face. Simultaneously inspired by Faraday's experiments, Simon Stamfer developed the stroboscopic effect, which was essentially identical to Plateau's invention, with the exception of some variations utilizing a cylindrical design. Although Plateau was the first to create this illusion, the popular name for the effect would take its name from Stamfer's version, the stroboscopic effect. When these two parallel inventions began being commercially produced, all sorts of variations and knockoffs were developed, and their widespread popularity helped contribute to the birth of a new medium, one based on motion picture illusionism. The star of motion picture destiny, always traveling westward in the course of the race, reached England with Roger. One day, while engaged in his inquiry into the affairs of the external senses, he chanced to glance from his study window to note the approach of a vehicle. It was only a baker's cart, and Roger hurriedly turned back to his papers. But as he turned away, the line of his vision swept past the interferences of the slats of a Venetian blind. Through the slitted apertures, the scientist caught the impression that the cart was proceeding by jerks. He saw it, despite its rapid motion, momentarily at rest in each slit, and through each successive opening, he saw it in a different phase of motion. The invention of the spinning disc illusion of motion was popular and fascinating, but many wondered how the illusion really worked. In his 1833 patent and his explanatory pamphlet for the, his stroboscopic disc, Simon Stamfer emphasized the importance of the interruptions of the beams of light reflected by the drawings. While a mechanism would transport the images past the eye at an appropriate speed, the pictures had to be constructed accordingly to certain laws of physics and mathematics. He described the idea of persistence of vision only as the effect that made the interruptions go unnoticed. Here, the after image is not attributed to the quality of perceived motion, but rather simply as the way our mind doesn't notice or is not bothered by the negative blank space between images. It's important to note that the after image is a retinal phenomena. In overly simplistic terms, it's actual physiological information that your eye is sending to your brain. The brain, of course, also plays some role in perceiving the illusion of persistence of vision, but in an entirely different sense than how it perceives parent motion. Similarly, a physician by the name of William Benjamin Carpenter insisted that the illusion was mental rather than retinal. Here, it is clear that it was not the inventors of the discs, nor the scientific contemporaries who invented the myth of the persistence of vision. Rather, they used the term to refer to a specific effect. The mythology, perhaps, then, begins with film historians. Inspired by a misinterpreted quote, Terry Ramesey and Arthur Knight, two film historians, both write of persistence of vision as the founding illusion of cinema, and they attribute the discovery of this illusion to Roger. Referring back to the wheelbarrow illusion, Ramesey in 1926 described the moment in which Roger witnessed the effect as if it were that legendary apple falling on Newton's head. But it was built on a fundamental misunderstanding of Roger's writings. In his article, he speculates that the illusion of the curved wheel spokes is similar to other phenomena, which he described as the illusion that occurs when a bright object is wheeled rapidly around in a circle, giving rise to the appearance of a line of light throughout the whole circumference, if sufficiently vivid, will remain for a certain time after the cause has ceased. The comparison between these two very different visual effects helped kickstart a trend in film academia to misleadingly equate the physiological perception of motion with the prolonged detection of light on the retina. Even though Roger and his contemporaries are not to blame for this myth, it should be noted that Roger's failure to comprehensively explain his illusion left an epistemological vulnerability, or a logical leap to be made. Film scholars mistakenly took this leap as gospel.
In their attack on this myth, Joseph and Barbara Fisher praised Roger's explanation for the mathematical origin of the illusion of curving, but critique his inability to account for the phenomena as a whole. It could not be, as Roger suggests, so simple a process as the fusing of slowly decaying traces upon the retina, for the curved spokes persist even when the eye is moved about over the display. To put the matter another way, when Roger speaks of tracings remaining upon the retina for a sufficiently bright object, he is apparently referring to after images. Yet it is well known that after images, since they are in fact tracings of stimulation left upon the retina, yield stabilized images, an image that is on the retina itself and therefore moves as the eye moves. If after images were involved in the spoke wheel illusion, the results would be a plethora of images resulting from the tracing scattered around the retina according to separate fixations of the eye. This of course is not what one sees. What is seen is a single unified symmetrical pattern of curved spokes, no matter how one moves his eye about. Thus we are forced to conclude that while Roger explained very well the mathematical origin of the curves, paths of the stimulus itself, he was unable to account properly for the phenomenal experience as a whole. It is at the level of accounting for human processing for the stimulus array that he falls short. No psychologist today would attempt to explain the phenomena solely in terms of processing occurring at the level of the retina. Unfortunately, modern psychologists have not attempted to explain this phenomenon at all. Direct references to Roger's observation are non-existent in contemporary literature on perception. The phenomenon which he describes has little, if anything, to do with filmic illusion. Roger has described a case in which a series of moving parts results in the perception of a static image. In cinema, a series of static images results in the illusion of motion. Nevertheless, Roger's explanation of an optical deception in the appearance of the spokes of a wheel seen through vertical apertures has been accepted by a generation of film scholars as the valid explanation of the perception combination of successive frames of a motion picture. So even if the myth of persistence of vision was later rejected by psychologists and other scientific fields, the question still stands. What is going on? Why do repeated images at a certain speed under the right conditions create the illusion of motion? Throughout the first decade of the 1900s and into the second, motion picture film was rapidly becoming more widespread and by 1912, buildings dedicated to showing films were accessible to the public in many major cities. But while the illusion founded upon Plateau's invention was thriving and becoming a whole art form onto its own, some scientists still sought to explain the strange phenomenon, and, in fact, to explain some more fundamental things about the operation of the human mind. These men founded the Gestalt School of Psychology. One of the founders of the Gestalt School, Max Wertheimer, began his studies right around the time of the birth of film, and around 1912, Wertheimer began to adopt the term Gestalt quality, which was coined by his professor Christian von Ehrenfels to refer to the essential nature of a perceptual experience. An example of Gestalt quality, the school was named after, is what allows a tune to be transposed to a new key using completely different notes while still retaining its identity. The Gestalt School saw the tendency to break psychological phenomena down into smaller parts as misguided. They opposed the then dominant structuralist school of thought, which used an atomistic approach, in which all knowledge, even complex, abstract ideas, are built from simple elementary constituents. The Gestalt School of Thought considered perceptual experience to be more than the sum of its sensory components. Correspondingly, they insisted that psychologists should study the way the perceptual experience appears first as whole and then can be divided into parts. What is given me by the melody does not arise as a second process from the sum of the pieces of such. Instead, what takes place in each single part already depends upon what the whole is. The alleged evidence for this concept was largely founded on an experiment by Wertheimer, in which he observed objectless motion, or as he dubbed it, phi phenomena. Wertheimer soon began experimenting with projection techniques, inspired by the stroboscope, and discovered the phi phenomenon. 
The phi phenomenon, in the broadest possible terms, is a visual illusion in which stationary objects appear to move when presented in a rapid sequence. The illusion has been described as a disembodied perception of motion, or a diffuse, amorphous, shadow-like something seems to jump in front of the stimuli and occlude them temporarily. The Gestalt psychologists believed that the apparent movement in the phi phenomenon is due to an electrical charge passing across the brain, giving a sense of movement. This idea and the simple design of experimental apparatus to test it led to significant research into visual perception. Today, however, the electrical charge theory on the brain is no longer considered a valid explanation of phi phenomenon. Scientists do not fully understand what causes the illusion of apparent motion with beta movement or phi phenomenon. Still, most theories involve a physiological rather than psychological explanation and have to do with various ways the brain and optic nerves communicate. It is important to understand what this effect is, as it is often misused as a synonym for beta movement, which is a separate yet similar phenomenon. But because the viewer also perceives two distinct lines, and not the continuous motion of objects, it is considered to be a separate phenomenon. Ultimately, the phi phenomenon didn't end up affecting the history of film as much as it did the history of psychology, as it initiated a shift in the way perception was studied. Although phi phenomenon surely has an occasional effect on film viewing experiences, it does not serve as a explanation for how the mind sees apparent motion. Although the phi phenomenon remains largely unexplainable, one model for the human mind is able to account for the illusion, the hassenstein reichardt model. In a series of experiments by two scientists named Bernhard Hassenstein and Werner Reichardt, they measured the visual reflexes or optometer response of a beetle. Quote, this response is the animal's tendency to follow the movement of the visual surround to compensate for its mistaken perception of self-motion in the opposite direction. The beetle was glued to a rod, so it could not move its body, head, or eyes relative to the surround, but could express its behavior at decision points by rotating a Y maze globe under its feet. The results led to the development of a model for motion detection that became known as the correlation type motion detector, the hassenstein reichardt model. The core computation in this model is a delay and compare mechanism delaying the brightness signal as measured by one photoreceptor by a low-pass filter and comparing it by multiplication with the instantaneous signal derived from a neighboring location. Doing this twice in a mirror symmetrical fashion and subtracting the output signals of both subunits leads to a response that is fully directionally selective. It's based on sitting down and thinking like, all right, if I were going to design a circuit out of neurons to detect motion, what would be the different ways that I could do it? And uh, one of the earliest ideas was what's called the Reichert detector, okay. which is basically a very simple circuit where you have sort of two input neurons, and then you have um, two uh, processing neurons, and there's a time delay going from one to the other. Okay. Uh, so that if, uh, if you have uh, some object moving from left to right, then first the neuron on the left will detect it, then the neuron on the right will detect it, and if you have a, a time delay going uh, from the from the neuron on the left, then the signals will uh, will be coincident, and you have a coincidence detector. And the moving from left to right uh, neuron will go off uh, if it's if it's activated in that order. And then you have a similar time delay going in the opposite direction. And you know, if you spend ten minutes thinking about this, you could probably come up with uh, with something similar. If I I guess I've, you know, spoiled it for you, but if I were to put you in a room with this problem and not tell you what the solution was, it's probably what you would come up with also. Mm. So it takes yeah. about 10 minutes to come up with a theory. It's taken about 60 years mm. to validate it as true or false. <laughs> what Hassenstein and Reichardt were suggesting, in more simplistic terms, was a model of visual system, which detects motion by way of correlation. The mind perceives motion not by simply seeing things move, but by detecting a cross-correlation of light intensities from neighboring points. In short, suppose a detector that is perceiving motion and thus two visual inputs are received, 
and two signals correspond. The detector compares the signals and generates a direction-sensitive response. This concept of visual systems is thus creating the perception of motion by way of correlation between two points. This would potentially explain the reason why the mind supposes a relationship or motion occurring between the two flashpoints in Werthenheimer's experiments. But the field of motion perception is still being intensely researched, and while the reichardt hassenstein model has proven to be accurate in certain experiments, it has not been proven on the level of anatomy or physiology and remains just that, a model. Therefore, it is perhaps too early to lay to rest the mysteries of the Phi phenomenon. So, just to catch up, when the human eye is exposed to a series of images with strobing light at a frequency of 60 flashes per second, the mind utilizes something called persistence of vision to essentially remove the strobe effect from your vision. But this technique could just as easily be the appearance of a perfectly still image as an apparently moving one. So what is the other thing which appears to make it move? The answer, some claim, is beta movement. Before the Gestalt School, an Austrian scientist named Friedrich Kenkel began experimenting with light and noticed that he could create an uncanny optical illusion. In 1875, about 40 years after Plateau's invented the phenakotoscope, Kenkel discovered an optical effect caused by electric light. He found that, under the right conditions, people will see two quick, spatially separated but stationary electrical sparks as a single light moving from place to place while quicker flashes were interpreted as motion between two stationary lights. What's significant here is that the viewers aren't seeing the same type of objectless motion they were with the Phi phenomenon. They're actually seeing what appears to be the spark itself moving from one place to another. It's also highly significant that it's an illusion being created via electricity and is therefore considered by some to be the foundation of video. During Werthemeyer's experimentation, he created a similar illusion, which at the time he seemed to refer to as optimal motion. This effect was created by using a tachoscope, a projection device whose functionality is focused on displaying images for a specific amount of time, and usually used slides in combination with a camera-style shutter system. In the experiment, two figures in two different positions were shown, and when shown at a medium speed, the figures seemed to be moving from one position to the next. It was at higher speeds he found the aforementioned phi phenomenon. In 1913, a scientist by the name of Kurt Kafka, who had been one of Werthemeyer's test subjects, began doing subsequent experiments. Working with another scientist, Friedrich Kenkel, it was Kenkel who finally made the designation of beta movement. As the specific phenomenon where the viewer perceives the illusion of an object moving from one place to the next. And it is this beta movement which is now attributed as the reason for the central illusion of the motion picture and a video. But what actually distinguishes the two on a physical level? What actually is happening in our visual systems? It's important to reiterate that the process is largely mysterious, but that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of theories and research going on still to this day. A number of authors have taken up the question of the basis of the apparent movement illusions and their relation to the perception of real movement. The emerging view seems to be that there are two or perhaps even more distinctive mechanisms for processing apparent and real movement, each mechanism operating for a different type of stimulus. Apparent versus real movement, small versus large displacements, and the presence versus absence of higher order features. None of these studies presented a theory of phi as distinct from beta, but probably simply because of the confusion described earlier, proposing a theory of phi that can also explain beta at both of the perceptual and neurophysical levels of analysis is beyond the scope of this video. We will, however, present two lines of reasoning that might lead to the development of such theory. The first line of reasoning applies at the neuroatomical level. Starting with Ungleiter and Mishkin's 1982 study, a number of investigators conjectured that visual information is processed in two separate anatomical pathways. One pathway, which process position and motion, goes to the paradial cortex. The other pathway, which processes form and color, goes to 
the temporal cortex. Whenever an object is moving or changing positions, it is likely to stimulate both pathways, and the result is the perception of real or illusory beta movement. If, however, the change of the position of the object is too rapid, the frequency of the flickering is too high, it does not stimulate only the motion pathway because the motion pathway does process high speeds, but the form pathway does not. As a result, the perception may be of pure movement, i.e. a movement without any form. It is an open question at this time whether this line of reasoning would lead to a completely new mechanism, unrelated to the mechanism responsible for the other types of illusory movement. The second line of reasoning applies at the cognitive level. It is based on the assumption that the visual system solves an inverse problem of perception interpretation. Specifically given the proximal stimulus produced by an object, its representation at the retina where its image is transduced the task for the visual system is to infer the object itself. Since the proximal stimulus does not provide complete information about the physical world, the visual system has to impose constraints on the set of possible interpretations. In a follow-up to their landmark paper called The Myth of Persistence of Vision Revisited, from 1993, Joseph Anderson and Barbara Fisher write, we read a student paper, and we cringe. We attend the lecture of a seasoned film scholar, and we cringe. We cringe not only because they have chosen to perpetuate the notion of persistence of vision, but they apparently, even at this late date, do not understand its implications. By this time, most film scholars seem to have heard that the term persistence of vision is inadequate. Why are film people so reluctant to let go of this notion? Those engaged in film study cling to the persistence of vision because they need it. For film scholars, it is our myth of creation. It answers our central question of origin. Why, when we look at a succession of still images on the film, screen, or TV set, are we able to see a continuous moving image? We answer persistence of vision. Persistence of vision is the name given to the miracle by which the silver halide dust of photography is transformed into palpable, living motion. And just as the story of Adam and Eve explains not only the mechanisms by which people originated and reproduced, but also the relationship of human beings to God, the myth of creation for the motion picture explains not only the mechanism for the origin of motion, but the relationship of the film to the viewer. The viewer implied by the myth of persistence of vision is a passive viewer upon whose sluggish retina images pile up. The goal of this video was to make you understand motion pictures less rather than more, because motion pictures really are still a mysterious thing, and although beta movement seems to be a more accurate description of the impetus behind motion picture illusion, it doesn't really explain away much of anything at all. It's just a more precise term for the strange phenomenon which surrounds us now. The idea of motion picture film creating the believable illusion of motion when shot at and presented at the rate of 24 frames per second was one which came through practical trial and error, rather than an inventor stumbling upon some type of monolithic understanding of human vision. So, to be perfectly clear, persistence of vision is an incredibly important, if overemphasized, concept. It does indeed explain a fundamental concept of motion picture film. The shutter in a film projector, which covers the screen in darkness while one frame is out of place, while transitioning to the next is totally unnoticeable to the human eye. This is due to persistence of vision. Persistence of vision probably impacts your daily perceptual experience in ways one doesn't really make note of. But digital video really doesn't make much use of it, as there is no shutter and no need to fill the screen with darkness while moving from one frame to the next. Nowadays, frames are represented by data, which tells machinery how to arrange the lights in patterns which resemble said frame. Then the data simply tells the machinery what lights need to be changed to represent the next frame. So video really solely relies on beta movement to achieve the effect of motion picture illusion, which means beta movement is all around us. 
Yet still, it seems as if we have a long way to go before we can obtain a comprehensive knowledge of this phenomenon. I think there's a bit of a wider lesson to be learned here. We humans fancy that we've created a piece of technology that we have, in some ways, mastered the phenomenon which the technology exploits. But in reality, an invention can be created with some knowledge and can easily inspire some more without the inventor really ever picking up on the true understanding along the way. Technology, more than anything else, is centered around usage, and if we can get usage out of the motion picture medium, we will. We won't wait to truly understand it before we use it. Maybe we should be more honest with ourselves. We're seeing if things work out first and trying to understand them second. And the understanding part takes far longer. Ultimately, it's important to remember that even our ways of trying to understand things are based on effectiveness and usage. And truly understanding something beyond its usage is likely an experience few human beings ever have. Naturally, many of you will want to know what light is. You probably feel that if you know what light is, you can tell what it will do. But this is not the way to start the study of anything. What you should do first is to find out how light behaves. As you learn how it behaves, you will gradually form a concept of what light is. The energy from the light is going into your eye and then finally going to your brain and lasts on the back of your eye and, and in the whole pathway up to your brain for about a tenth of a second. Where they say, let's forget even having a, having a frame at all for thinking about uh, what the brain might be doing. Let's not have these sort of hypothesis-driven experiments. They, they sort of say, all right, we'll put the responsibility for interpreting this on you know, the next generation of scientists. 